Hi, it's Dennis Daly. The golden age of radio was one of the shortest golden ages of all time, yet during its run, radio brought about immense change in America. Radio brought us through the Depression and the Second World War, and then struggled on until television finally won the battle for supremacy in American media. Radio had begun just after the turn of the last century as dots and dashes listened to by do-it-yourself radio enthusiasts. Then early voice transmissions brought radio into its first age. By the 30s, the techniques were perfected, the networks were in place, and radio was on its way. The war changed everything, as did the coming of television. On the night of September 30th, 1962, when yours truly Johnny Dollar and Suspense signed off on the CBS radio network, the golden age ended. But radio's final 25 years were golden indeed. So join me now as we explore radio's last 25 years. 1944 would see the massive D-Day invasion on June 6th and the beginning of the deadly Battle of the Bulge. It was the year that Anne Frank and her family were discovered after years in hiding. After being trounced the previous year, the St. Louis Cardinals came back to win the 44 World Series over crosstown rivals the Browns, four games to two. On radio, the networks were trying as hard as they could to distract Americans, hoping we'd forget, if only for an hour, the misery of the war. This time around, a show guaranteed to bring a smile to everybody serving overseas, the Globe Theater, hosted by the great Herbert Marshall. Then a show that definitely was a wartime program from 1944, The Man Behind the Gun. Here's your pass to the Globe Theater. Just as the Globe Theater has meant the best in entertainment since the days of Shakespeare, today it means the best in radio drama. Here to tell you about tonight's play is your host at the Globe Theater, Herbert Marshall. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Globe Theater. This is the serviceman's playhouse, where the foremost actors and actresses of the stage and motion pictures appear for the exclusive entertainment of the armed forces of the Allies. Tonight, we have a bright comedy drama for you, with a whole stage full of stars. Basil Rathbone, Marsha Hunt, Eugene Pallette, Charles Irwin, and a cast of radio's best, plus music under the direction of Wilbur Hatch. The marquee reads, The Ghost Goes West. Maybe some of you remember seeing the picture by this title a number of years ago, before you slipped into uniform. Well, this is that same famous story with as many laughs and as much excitement plus a new cast. Basil Rathbone portrays the glory, both ghost and contemporary. Marsha Hunt is Peggy and Eugene Pallette is Martin, the grocery king. Stand by for the opening music on tonight's Globe Theatre production of The Ghost Goes West. Can my name, it's Murder Lowry. And just so we'll be understanding each other, I'm a ghost. Aye, but I wouldn't be doing a wee bit of harm to a single one of you. Oh, no, I used to be a human being myself. Oh, I was very human then, 200 years ago. 
I just couldn't resist the lassies. God bless them. And we'll... That's how the whole thing came about. It was a shepherdess that afternoon, as fresh and as bunny as a bud in a rose. Explain it to me again, please, Murdoch. So I'll understand this game you play. It's simple, lass. You see, I ask you a riddle. What's the difference between a thistle in the heather and a kiss in the dark? And if you cannot tell me, by the time I spell Killy Clunky, you must pay the forfeit. Ready now? K I L L. Very well, then you must pay me the forfeit. But kiss the forfeit? A kiss, of course. It's always a kiss. Come on now. Oh. I'm ready. I'm not back, sorry. The McLaggins. What is it, McLaggins? What you want with me? It's the boost that was made by your late father, Murdoch. He said that one cloudy could thrash 50 McLaggins. And now is that time for you to prove there's it. There's so many of you, and there's only one in me, and... Oh, sure, him, Gavin, and be done with No, it. you mustn't. You... <laughs> you killed him. You killed him. Oh, may heaven receive the soul of Murdoch Glory. <laughs> Murdoch, Murdoch, my son, can you hear me? I, I can hear you, Father. Where are you? I am in heaven. Then where am I? You're in limbo, my son. The empty place between heaven and earth. Because you died a coward's death. But, sir, there were so many of them. Coward's death. And so you can't be welcomed by your ancestors in heaven. No, you're doomed to be a ghost. A ghost. But people are afraid of ghosts, Father. I don't wish to frighten good folk. How long must I stay with this way? Each midnight you will walk the castle halls until you find a McLaggan there and twist his nose and make a meal and admit that one glory can thrash 50 McLaggans. Then and only then can you ascend from limbo and join your noble ancestors in heaven. Full two hundred years ago, that was. And every midnight since then, I've walked the castle halls. Aye, but the castle is different these days. The glory clan has come on hard times, and young Master Donald, <laughs> he's the one they say, looks so much like me. He's having his troubles, to be sure. He's that heavy in debt. It looks as though he'll be selling the castle. Aye, but who is there to buy it? Master Donald... Oh, Master Donald. What is it, McNiff? Uh, somebody to see you, sir. I it's about the castle. Good afternoon. My name is Donald Gloria. Yes? Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I, I didn't expect to see a girl. Why not? We're common enough. My name is Peggy Martin. I understand you want to sell this castle. Why, uh... uh... Yes, I mean, that is... Why do you stare at me like that? Is there anything strange about it? No, 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 nothing strange at all. You're very lovely. I mean... You're an American, aren't you? How'd you guess? Ever seen an American before? Oh, yes, several. Where, in the zoo? Oh, please forgive me. It's just that, well, I... We, do, we don't uh, often have anyone worth staring at here. And we don't have lovely old castles like this at home. I hope you won't be too hard on my father. Your father? Well, he's the one who'll have to pay for it, of course. Could I bring him here with my mother? Oh, yes, yes, of course, certainly I... Why not bring them here for dinner this evening? Oh, how nice of you. Oh, you you, uh, you don't have any other relatives, do you? I mean, no husbands, anything like that. <laughs> no husbands, not even one. Ah, then by all means, it's dinner. Uh, shall we say at nine? Well, thank you very much. We'll see you this evening. McNiff! McNiff! Oh, did she buy the castle, Master Donald? She will tonight. She's coming to dinner with her father and mother. But what about the glory ghost? He'll appear at midnight and there'll be no sale. Oh, no, no, no. They won't see him. They'll be gone by 12. Aye, they'll be gone. And so will the servants. They'll have no traffic with a ghost. Wonderful dinner, Mr. Glory. Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> and I guess I'm the one who ought to know. Really, sir? Oh, yes. My husband is in the food business himself. Martin's fine food from coast to coast. Over 20 million customers. You know, that's quite a responsibility. Filling 20 million stomachs every day. Yes, but it's very profitable, Mr. Glowry. That's why Dad can afford to make an offer on the castle. I see. Mother, isn't it wonderful? It's 600 years old, you know. That's very old, isn't it? Mr. Glowry, is it by any chance haunted? Well, uh, uh, you see... Uh... Mother's scared to death of ghosts, but I'm not. I'd love to meet one. Is there a ghost, Mr. Glowry? Well, uh, I suppose there are legends about every old place. 
Nonsense. There isn't any ghosts because ghosts don't exist. Just a lot of silly... Uh, what's that? Only, um, uh, only the, the, the bagpipes, Miss Martin. It's an old uh, Scottish custom during dinner. <clears throat> See. Listen, it's 12 o'clock, the witching hour. Joseph, we've got to get out of here. All right, Gladys, all right. Sorry, Mrs. Lowry. You know how these women are. We'll have to leave our business talk till morning. Joseph? Coming, dear. Come along, Peggy. Good night, Mr. Glowry, and thank you. It's been a wonderful evening. Yes, it's been very wonderful. Murder, Glowry, wherever you are, you've been a most considerate ghost not appearing tonight, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Don't thank him, Master Donald. Thank me. You, McNiff? I I set the clock an hour ahead. Oh, then it's only 11. It... Who is that now? I'll see. Yes? Hello. I'm back again. Oh, Miss Martin. Did you know your clock is an hour fast? Really? I, uh, well... I just happened to notice the clock in the car, and then Daddy got a grand idea. You know, it's simply, it's just silly to buy a place without ever having stayed in it. So I thought, well, I, I mean, well, could you put me up for the night? For the night? Oh, any little corner will do, any extra room. Oh, of course, yes, certainly. Mrs. McNiff, I, I believe we have a, a guest for tonight. <laughs> clock again. Must be midnight now. I wonder if... Yes? Yes? Who is it? I thought I heard the... Oh, why, it's Mr. Glowry. Of course. All dressed up like that and Tartan and killed. For a moment I thought you were a ghost. I I'm a ghost. I'm the famous ghost of Glowry Castle. <laughs> and they say the Scotch have no sense of humor. Why do you laugh? Do you know, believe me? Oh, of course I do. And I think you look marvelous in that fancy dress costume. Well, this. Oh, it's just what I happened to be wearing on the day of my death. Oh, you, you're dead. When, when did that happen? Well, I forget the exact date. But it must be all of 200 years ago. 200 years. My, my, for goodness sake. And you look so young. Do you not realize that we never age? Or are you no use to meeting ghosts? No, this is my very first encounter. And I'm surprised I'm not terrified of you, Donald. Why do you call me Donald when my name is Murdoch? Because I'm no more frightened of Murdoch than I would be of Donald. <laughs> I'm glad of that. I wouldn't uh, like to alarm such a bonny wee lass. Oh, it's been a long time since I saw the like of you. Not since that day I was teaching the bonny shepherd as the... Tell me. Do you give me the, the, the game of spell me a riddle? No. How's it played? You see, I ask you a riddle. Like, what's the difference between a thistle in the heather and a kiss in the dark? And if you cannot answer by the time I spell Killy Cranky, you must pay the forfeit. Ready now? K I L. -L. I, I give up. Then you must pay the forfeit. We are kissed. Uh ho. -oh. All right, but first you've got to tell me the answer. Oh, no. The forfeit comes first. Oh, no, it doesn't. I tell you, it does. And I tell you, good night. Dinner go, will us. Come out. Come out, or I'll come in. Oh. Murdoch, my son. Aye, Father, I know. <laughs> but it's been so long, Father, so long since I saw a, a lass as bonny as that wee one. Good morning, Miss Martin. Your father's here. He's looking over the place. You know, I like you, Donald. Like me? Oh, do you really? Very much. I like people who do crazy things. Crazy things? Like dressing up last night and pretending to be a ghost. Oh, oh, that. And are you going to tell me the answer this morning? Answer? I, I'm afraid I don't quite... You know, the riddle. Oh, oh, oh the, the, the riddle. No, no, I, 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 I can't tell you just now. You see... Well, I guess I'll never know the answer till I pay the forfeit. So, here it is. There, there's your kiss. Now, what's the answer? Well, I... Oh, no, no. You, you, you can't have the answer yet. But I've just paid you, you for it. You think one kiss is enough for the secret mystery of Glowdy Castle? Oh, no, no. That, that's just the beginning of the forfeit. But that's not fair. You said... Oh, there you are, Glory. 
I guess I've seen enough. But, Mr. Martin, I wasn't doing anything. <laughs> no, but I was. I just looked the whole place over, and I might as well make my top offer first. Fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand? On one condition, though, you've got to come with the place. C- come with it? On contract, of course, two hundred a week. But uh, what must I do? Oh, you just supervise the job, that's all. What job? Why, when we rip the castle down... Rip it down? Why, sure, that's the idea. Take the whole place down, stone by stone, and ship it over and put it up again. (laughs) Get it, Mr. Glory? In America. Peter, can you no hear me? Aye, my God, my son, I can hear you. Peter, what is this strange place? Where am I? You're in the hold of a ship, my son, on your way to America. But I don't want to go to America. I don't want to be a confounded colonist. You must go, my son, with the old glory castle which you dishonored. But, Father, must I stay down here in the hold all the time? Oh, when it's dark, you can walk out on the deck, my son. But mind you... No trifling with the lassies now. It's nice out here on deck, isn't it, Donald? I mean, much nicer than being inside. All that crowd at the ship's masquerade. Yes, it, it, it's much nicer out here, Peggy. Not that you look as silly as the rest. You know, you're very handsome in that Scotch costume. Oh, it's just the glory tartan and kilts. That's what I mean. Donald. Yes? When you've finished rebuilding the castle in Florida, why not live in it? But uh, you'll be living there yourself. That's all the more reason. We could be together. You and I... It's, we... it's getting rather cold out here, isn't it? Uh, shall I go and fetch a rug? Oh, yes, if you wish. I-, I won't take a moment. I'll be back right away. Oh, Peggy Martin, you must be slipping. Can't even get the guy to tell you this. You lost. We heard on that before, we two. <laughs> Don't be silly. You just went to get me a... Wait. Uh, it, it comes to me now. We played games together. Obviously, you're very fond of games. I, especially the riddle game. If you follow me, it, it's a means to an end. You mean so you can... <laughs> oh, I understand. And I apologize. Apologize for what, lass? Having misjudged you, Donald. Donald? Oh, do I have to tell you again? I'm no Donald, I'm Murdoch. Oh, Murdoch, yes. Yeah, I'm the ghost of Glory Castle. Oh, Mr. Glory. Uh, Mr. Glory, sir. Uh, uh, Go away, man. Can't you see I'm busy? I'm sorry, sir. I'm just doing my job. I'm the ship's photographer, you know, getting pictures of all the best costumes. Oh, uh, this is Mrs. (laughs) Ortenberry. I'm Cleopatra tonight. Isn't it fun? Oh, no. What do you what do you wish with me? I just want to shoot you and Mrs. O together. Shoot me. I won't take a second. Now, steady, sir. Stop. Take that infernal machine away. Take it away, or I Hey. Hey, he's gone. Just disappeared right into thin air. Murdoch. It was Murdoch Lowry. A ghost. A ghost. A ghost. Up on the promenade deck. They say he's walking in the hole, the ghost. I tell you, I saw him myself, as big as life. Of course, I don't believe in ghosts myself, Donald. It's my wife. These silly women. She isn't silly, Mr. Martin. There really is a ghost. Dreaming up all sorts of... Huh? Uh, What's that? Yes, I've seen him many times myself. Oh, well, uh, uh, under the circumstances, it breaks my heart, of course, but uh, out of deference to my wife's wishes... Joe Martin! Well, there you are. Oh, hello, Ed. Uh, Meet Mr. Glowry, the fellow that sold me the castle. Donald, this is Mr. Biglow, a competitor of mine. Owns the Biglow chain store. Congratulations, young man. You too, Joe. Congratulations? What for? Say, the radio is humming with that ghost story of yours. Why, it'll make the front page of every paper in New York. Pretty smart publicity, Joe. Well, it isn't publicity, and it isn't my castle anymore. My wife made me give it back. Hey, Glory, is it true? I'm afraid it is. No fooling. You know, I might be interested in making you an offer for that castle. 
What's the idea, Ed? What for? Oh, publicity. Just think, a ghost comes all the way across the Atlantic to proclaim the merits of the big low chain stores. What? You mean you're going to use my ghost? Oh, uh-huh, it isn't your ghost. You gave it back. Lowry, I'm offering 100000 And I'm offering 125 Joe, you can't do that. Your wife won't let you. My wife hasn't anything to say about this. From now on, this ghost is strictly business. Peter, this is Murdoch. Can you now hear me? Aye, I can hear you, my son. Peter, I didn't like it here. I didn't like Florida. That, my son, is a privilege reserved for Californians. <laughs> they finished rebuilding the castle now, Peter. And they've turned the brightest lights on it. Ah, yes, I know. Publicity. Publicity. A form of human madness, my son. Aye, but there's more tape than that, Father. They put a huge picture of me outside on a great banner that says, The Glory Ghost Prefers Martin's Fine Foods. And are they no fine, my son? How should I know, Father? I haven't eaten a bite in 200 years. Uh. <laughs> something even more dire. And what is that, my son? This Martin's given a banquet tonight to prove to skeptics that I really exist, and fearing that I might not appear, he plans that young Donald shall go in my place, dressed like me, pretending to be a glory ghost. Young Donald was cast in your very image, my son. I can scarce tell the two of you apart. But the lady is an amateur. It does not even belong to the ghostly guild. Father, how much longer do I have to bear with this? You can your sentence, Murdoch, my son, until the glories are avenged. Twelve o'clock, time to go downstairs and play my masquerade. Well, might as well get it over with. But this is the last time I'll... Oh! Oh! Sorry. Murdoch. Murdoch Lowry in Tartan and Kilt. Murdoch? How do you know I'm not Donald? Oh, it couldn't be. Donald left this afternoon. My dad just told me. And aren't you afraid of Murdoch Lowry? Oh, I couldn't be afraid of anyone I've known so long. Murdoch, remember that first night in Scotland? I, I remember, Peggy. Peggy? That's the first time you've called me by my name. Sounds as if you really were Donald. If Donald was speaking, you wouldn't listen. Oh, I would. But he won't be speaking to me anymore. He's gone. He wasn't very much interested in me. I think you're mistaken. You do? Oh, yes. You see, I know him very well. He's one of those stupid men who are afraid to speak. I guess I was stupid, too, and proud. I couldn't tell him how I felt. But if he came back and said what was in his heart, that he loves you... If he loved me, he wouldn't have gone away without saying a word. Nobody wants to say a lot of words to you. And he, he may not be very far from here... What will you say to him, Peggy? Oh, I'd tell him I love him. But he won't come back. He will. He, he will come back, I promise you, as soon as... Uh, excuse me, lass. I must be off. I have a little matter to attend to downstairs. Well, it's after midnight, and your ghost hasn't shown yet, Joe. I still don't think there is any ghost. Now, don't you worry, Ed Biglow. He'll be here, though he'll probably be sorry he came when he sees you in that Scotch costume you're wearing. Uh, what about you? What about the outfit you've got on? Well, I'll have you know this is a Glowry Tartan. And who's got a better right to wear it than me? I own Glowry Castle, don't I? Well, then where's the famous Glowry I'm Ghost? I said there won't be any Glowry Ghost tonight. Huh? What's that? Donald, I... Why, I thought you'd gone. I'm sorry, Mr. Marty, but I had some unfinished business here. Oh, say, Joe, he's wearing the same tartan as you. I guess you both belong to Martin's fine food clan, huh? (laughs) Yeah, you lay off of him, Ed. Donald here is a real glowery. Yeah, so what? My family's a lot more important than his. Oh, really? I've never heard of the clan Bigelow. Uh, Not Bigelow. It's on my mother's side. I'm the last member of the clan McLoggin. McLaughlin. Yes, and I've had enough of this phony business. I'm going home. You can't, you can't, Mr. Bigelow, wait. Oh, save the explanations. I'm going home. No, you don't, no, you don't. Murdoch, Murdoch, 
I've got an McClaglum for you. Oh, here, yeah. what's the meaning of this? Let go of me. Let's go of it. McClaglum. In, in a tray to move. Who are you? Where'd you come from? Out to the limbo where I've been waiting for over 200 years. Oh, you, you can't be Donald. There, there are two of you here. You must be the... Murdoch. The ghost of Glory Castle. Oh, oh, and the dragon. Present your nose. Oh, please, I, I didn't mean anything. I... Oh, my nose. Down on your knees, McLagan. Repeat after me. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anything you Repeat, say. I humbly apologize for the insult to my superiors, the Glory. And I humbly apologize for the insult to my superiors, the Glory. And I freely admit that one Glory can thrash any 50 McLagans who ever lived. Uh, and I freely admit that one Glory can thrash any 50 McLagans who ever lived. Fable! Did you hear him, Fable? Is that enough? Hi, my son. Your mission is fulfilled. You may now join your noble ancestors in heaven. Uh, thank you, Fable. Oh, I'm grateful indeed, for I have grown very, very weary of this earth. So you see, Peggy, when we met in the hall and you thought I was Murdoch... I saw my chance to tell you how I felt. Tell me again. Do you love me, Don? I do, I do, I do. Oh, that's three times as much as I ever dared hope for. Donald, now will you tell me the answer to the riddle? <laughs> I'm sorry, Peggy, I don't know the answer. But I paid you the forfeit with a kiss. Then for the honor of the glories, I must give it back. Mm. There. Would you consider yourself even now? Yes. But, Donald... What, darling? Riddle me another riddle, please. And thus the ghost in the best Scottish tradition has gone west. And we have come to the conclusion of another play from the stage of the Globe Theatre. Our stars were Basil Rathbone, Marsha Hunt, Eugene Pallett, and Charles Irwin. You have been listening to the Globe Theatre with Herbert Marshall as host and master of ceremonies. Now let's change gears and go from Herbert Marshall's narration to an exciting episode of a show that only ran during World War II. The man behind the gun is a woman. Broadcasting System presents The Man Behind the Gun, dedicated to the fighting men and women of the United States and the United Nations, and broadcast in the hope that these authentic accounts of men and women of war will bring you a better understanding of the job being done by our fighting forces everywhere in the world, and the job we have to do to keep them well. This is something for the girls. This story is for the girls who swoon at the sight of blood as readily as they swoon at the sight of the crooner. This is for the girls to whom war's greatest tragedy is no nylons. This is for those American girls not yet in uniform, blue, green, khaki, or war worker slacks. This is something for the girls. Italy, January 1944. Face deflection left. One, four, zero. 
Number two. One round. Quadrant. Two. Eight. Five. Fire! 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 the first time you hear it. You open the flap of your tent and look up at the sky. But the fading day is clear and blue the way it is in Italian travel posters. Even so, you turn the palm of your hand up, feeling for rain. The soldier who's digging the drain around your tent grins at you. It ain't gonna rain, Lieutenant. That's some of the artillery you're hearing up at Murano Pass. They sound off almost every day at sunset. Artillery? Up there? Yes, ma'am. You'll get used to it after a while. Enemy artillery. You look toward Murano Pass, toward the road that leads to Rome. For a moment, you feel the immensity of the job you've taken on. You, an army nurse. An officer in the medical corps. An army nurse. Sharer of pain. Life giver. Mother, sister, girlfriend. Confessor, letter writer, psychiatrist, good sport. Florence Nightingale in slacks. Clara Barton in a slit trench. You've got a big assignment, sister. A big assignment. So it's your first night in the tent. The place is an evacuation hospital only 20 miles behind the lines. The guns are still sounding off up in the pass. You roll over on your cot, restless and wide awake, listening to the others gab. I'm not going to get any sleep. I wonder if they keep that up all night. Probably. They must have heard we were coming. A greeting from Adolf. Huh? Adolf who? (laughs) Isn't it wonderful? Just mention a man's name and the flower of Savannah wakes right up. How can she think of sleep with all that racket? Darling, it's all in having the proper frame of mind. I just don't let things bust me, that's all. Get her. We've got mud, flies, dirt, and rats. No running water and do our washing in a helmet. Freeze at night and bake by day and she isn't fussed. It is a little rugged here, isn't it? Oh, let's hit the sack, honey. I'm going to look a sight if I don't get some sleep. gabbing for a while, but you stare into the darkness and listen to the guns on Murano. You know there's going to be an attack soon because you've been assigned to a mobile surgical unit. A mobile unit is an operating room on wheels. An operating room in a heavy-duty truck moving up with the attack. You're the surgeon's right hand, an indispensable prop in his technique. The surgeon expects you to be good. Some surgeons expect you to be perfect. Like Captain Ricker, for instance. You gotta be 200% plus when you're working with him. That's what the sergeant told you this morning when he was typing out your orders. Captain Ricker? Yeah. He operates so fast, it's like trying to hand instruments to an octopus. He's got a pull motor where his heart ought to be. I wouldn't want to be in your spot, Collins. Your spot. You're going to scrub for Captain Ricker. Scrub means that you're the surgical nurse. The one who hands the surgeon his instruments, prepares the table, sets the stage for the operation. What if you're not good enough? What if you fumble? Back home, you are hot stuff at the local hospital. But this is going to be up near the front line. Not three or four operations a day. Here you'll have 15, 20, maybe 30. You're going up with the attack. Checking the supply table, Captain Ricker's unit. All right, shoot. Forceps, one hemostatic rank and killing. One hemostatic rank and killing. One hemostatic Jones, five inch. One hemostatic Jones, five inch. One package of sutures, soap, braided. Hey, have you seen the new nurses? One suture, soap, braided. Yeah, when they first came in. Nice looking bunch. Scissors, two curved nails. Two curved nails. You talked to any of them yet? Yeah, yeah, Lieutenant Collins. I was fixing the drain around the tent yesterday. Mm-hmm. She heard the shooting up on Murano. Wanted to know if it was thunder. Forceps, one halstead mosquito straight. One straight halstead mosquito. Pretty? Who? Lieutenant Collins. She 
She had on slacks and a helmet. Oh. Anyway, I've only got two stripes. You know, in the movies, rank don't make any difference. She loves you for your funny character. Yeah. Forceps, one straight killing. One straight killing. In the movies, you're from Texas. Just a big, lovable kid, always getting in trouble. You get the top of your skull knocked in, but she saves your life, see? Well, in the final scene, the two of you are on the deck of a transport. Your arm around her ship. Answer that, will you? Medical Supply Depot, Corporal Kirk Meyer. Yes, Captain. Yes, sir, we're checking the supplies for the truck now. Yes, sir, right away, we'll... We'll hop right to it, sir. Was that Ricker? Yeah, we gotta get this stuff out quick. We're moving up. Oh, You're moving up with the surgical right. truck, the operating room on wheels. And all the complex personnel of a forward echelon of the medical corps. Litter bearers, aid men, cooks, drivers, electricians, mechanics. The infinitely detailed plan is taking shape. Searcher, cat gut, plane number two. Repeat the number. Cat gut, number two. Number two! Four rounds! Squadron! One, seven, zero! Fire! Infinitely detailed plan. The barrage opens against Murano, and the surgical unit moves out from the evacuation hospital. Two trucks, one a mobile operating room, now on the road, leading north. You're riding in the front seat of the first truck, wedged between the driver and Captain Ricker. It's beginning to rain. The road is rim deep in mud. You haven't figured Captain Ricker out yet. So far, he's the commanding officer. You, a junior officer. He's polite, impersonal. You worked in a mobile unit before, Lieutenant? Yes, sir, all of us have. Our maneuvers with the Third Army back in Louisiana. That's good. You'll find our procedure here somewhat similar. Unless, of course, the casualties are heavier than we expect. Sometimes speed is more important than preventing fatalities and complete aseptic technique. Shock is one of the big problems. Cigarette? Thank you, I'd like one. Strictly business, this Captain Ricker. A machine like this truck churning up the mud of this mountain road under four-wheeled power. Suddenly, you're on top of the ridge. To the left and northward, you see a mountain range. Five miles across as a P-38 flies. Nine miles to the crawling infantry. Between the mountains, there's a pass. Captain Ricker smiles for the first time. That's Murano, Lieutenant. An MP is on the road ahead, pointing to a driveway. The truck turns off into a deep, rutted lane. At the end of the lane, you see a courtyard and a farmhouse. This is the assembly area. Now you're in support of the attack, and radio silence is abandoned. The medical plan goes into effect. Clearing station five to mobile unit. Testing. Over. Mobile unit. We can hear you. Over. We're in position and ready. We lose contact, we'll communicate by ambulance message. Over. Okay. Give us number and type of casualties when they start coming in. We're standing by. Okay. Out. The mobile unit stands by in the rear. Just ahead of it is the clearing station, classifying casualties. Farther forward, the collecting station. Then the aid stations. Out from the aid stations, the litter bearers. Ahead of the litter bearers, the company aid men, crawling forward with the attacking battalion. Each unit and individual of the medical corps waiting for one precise moment. Aid men, bearers, ambulance drivers, nurses, doctors, waiting for this. Oh. Oh. Medic. Medic. Over here. Medic. standing in the living room of the farmhouse which you've converted into a receiving ward. This is the setup for the assembly line of pain. Ten cuts, plasma apparatus, bandages, hypodermics, a portable autoclave for sterilizing linen. Outside in the courtyard, the operating room in the truck is in order. Lieutenant. Yes, Captain. Station 5 just called. The first ambulances are on the way over. Here's a list of cases. Your table is set up? Yes, sir. Lieutenant Leggett. Yes, sir. Fix three shock beds, will you? Yes, sir. Lieutenant Bradley. Yes, sir. 
You'll use your own judgment on anesthesia. Yes, Captain. You'll look at the what case list. It's worse than you expected. You can Eight severe it. casualties and the attack has just begun. All right, Lieutenant, I'm going to scrub. Let me know when you're ready on the table. We will. You watch Ricker go out to the trucks. Bradley looks at the case list in your hand. Eight. How many? Eight. Funny. Doesn't look like anything's happening up there, does it? Just a little smoke. They say that's the way it always is. Until the cases start coming in. Then up there and back here get to be the same place. Ambulances are coming. All right. Let's get to work. You're scrubbing your hands at the small basin in the operating truck. The wounded boy on the table is breathing quietly. Bradley removes the ether cone. You look at the boy. His face is ashen gray. This is your first wounded. This kid who stopped a grenade fragment up at Morano. You put on your rubber gloves. Your face is masked. Bradley nods her head. Anesthesia is complete. You prepare your sterile towels to cover the operating area. Captain Rickard comes into the truck. Can I start to paint? Go ahead, Captain. The doctor takes his place. Swing the mail table into position and stand at Rickard's right. Rickard starts to paint. To swap the skin with methylate. Now it begins. Now the assembly line of pain moves forward. And this is only the first one. First, chemostats to stop the flow of blood. Curb Kelly. You slap the Kelly into Ricker's hand. Slap it hard. Suture to tie up the severed vessels. Another tie. He makes the tie, removes the hemostats. Tie, hemostat. The process continues. Suction. You're ready with the suction in the bulb syringe. Saline in the bulb to clean out the wound. Saline. Suction. Suction. Saline. Cleaning. Preparing the way for the scissors. Straight mail. An hour is gone, and this is only the first case. You're trying to achieve the delicate operative rhythm of surgeon and nurse. But you feel like a drag on Ricker. His hands move like lightning. Sponge. Sponge. Probe. Curved Kelly, straight Kelly, suits you. Bloody bandages on the floor. He's got the shell fragments now. It's off a powder. Suit you. Close the wound. It's over. The soldiers take the stretcher off the operating table. You start to remove your rubber gloves. Corporal. Yes, sir. We're ready for the next one. The next one. The pilot. He begins to paint. The lightning hands move faster. Straight Kelly. The incredible hands. You can't feed them fast enough. Knife, scissors, forceps, suture. Never stopping. Suction. Did you hear? Suction. Yes, Captain. You'll have to be quicker, Lieutenant. Much quicker. They're ready for the next one. Knife. The hours pile up. The air in the truck gets stale. Your eyes burn. Your hands tremble. Sponge. Sponge. Yes, Captain. You want someone to relieve you, Lieutenant? No, sir. I'm all right. You're not. You're getting punchy. Next case. Fractured femur. Next. Torn kidney. You're working on nerve now. Four in a row and he hasn't stopped. Seven hours. You can't take any more. You want a relief, Lieutenant? No, sir. I'm all right. Number five. The kid who's going to lose his leg. No, Doc. Please, please. Even the drugs can't quiet the kid. Please, Doc. No, no. Take it easy now. No, no, you mustn't. Ah! You can't take any more. You are punchy. You didn't figure it was going to be like this. You can't take it. Ricker's voice seems to be so far away. Knife. 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 You just can't take it. You couldn't take it. But somehow you did. Somehow you got through the first night. It's morning now, and it's raining worse than ever. You're in the kitchen of a farmhouse gulping coffee with Bradley. On the unit. The soldier who works the radio has set up his transmitter by the stove. Come in, clearing station. On the unit, the clearing station. Come in, clearing station. He's been Mobile saying unit, that for 20 station. minutes. Come in. Now he gets up abruptly. Would you listen to the signals, Lieutenant? I've got to see Captain Ricker. Okay, Sergeant. What's that mean? I don't know. Maybe the clearing station's pulled out and gone forward. Maybe it's coming back this way. They haven't sent an ambulance in the last hour. 
It might mean anything. Lieutenant Cullen. Yes? That fracture case is asking for you again. I'm coming. You haven't finished your coffee. It can wait. You come into the farmhouse living room. Seven quiet forms on the cots. One died in the night. You go to the boy who asked for you. The one with the shattered hip. You sit by his side. Miss... I mean, nurse. Could I have a drink? You give him some water. He doesn't really want the water. He wants you there. A woman for his pain. You smile at him when he hands you back the glass. Nurse. Would you... Would you just sit here for a while? Sure, soldier. You take the boy's hand and hold it. You sit quietly till he seems to sleep. Suddenly you realize you've made the grade. Now you're really an army nurse. You look out the window and wonder how it's going up at Murano. Unit. About nine miles up the road. I think they're in a farmhouse. Thanks. Hey, uh, how's it going in Murano? All balls up. They're pounding the battalion to pieces with a counterattack. The aid stations are pulling out. Oh, my back. Nine miles up the road? Yeah, yeah. So just keep asking as you go. Okay. <laughs> like it's bleeding again. I have a look. You thought he was asleep. You lift up the blanket. It's bleeding, isn't it? A little. We'll fix that. You get up from the cot and go over to the portable autoclave. Sterile dressings are running low. The boy who lost his leg is on the cot next to the autoclave. Lieutenant, would you move me just a bit? He knows he's lost his leg. He's trying to keep talking so he won't cry. You move him gently. Nurse. Nurse. I'm coming. That's the kid who stopped the grenade fragment. Now they're coming to life after the operations. Now they need you. Ricker has his helmet and coat on. The two enlisted men are carrying equipment out to the trucks. You're sitting with the kid called Eddie, checking his pulse, watching him closely. Are we pulling out, Lieutenant? No. They're sending some of the equipment up forward. Oh, forward. That's good. They can't move us for a couple of days, huh, Lieutenant? That's right. Look, if I give you something to make you sleep... Oh, I don't need it now. I'm okay. Ricker is watching you. You've been told to get your helmet and field pack. But you sit with Eddie. Lieutenant Collins. Yes, sir? May I see you a moment? Ricker goes out to the kitchen and you follow him. Lieutenant, we've rigged up the truck to take the four movable cases with us. Corporal Kirkmeyer has volunteered to stay here with the four who can't be moved. Corporal Kirkmeyer is a very good soldier, sir, but he's no nurse. Those men need a nurse. I understand that. But it's a risk that must be taken. We'll attempt to send an ambulance here tomorrow when the men can be moved. And if the ambulance doesn't get through? If this is enemy territory tomorrow? I said it's a risk that must be taken. Those men need a nurse. I'd like permission to stay, sir. I'm sorry. The men won't live through the night if they realize they've been abandoned. I'm sorry. You're sorry, you're sorry. Stop talking like a machine. I'm not going to do it, do you hear? I'm staying here. Are you going to force me to give you an order? Oh, for the love of heaven, be human, will you? You're nothing but an instrument, an operating technique that walks. Well, I'm not going to let those kids die. I'm not, I'm not. Lieutenant. <laughs> Lieutenant Collins. Yes, sir. I'm 
I'm all right now. I'm sorry, sir. Forget it. Cigarette? Thanks. You see my position. Yes, I see it. Someone has to give the orders. Yes. I'm... I'm not a machine, Lieutenant. I didn't mean that. I'm not really. I feel I get hurt, I blunder, just like anybody else. I'm not sure of a lot of things, and I make mistakes. But someone has to decide who is to go and who will stay. But... I know how you feel. Still, you want me to go? Yes. Captain, is that an order? Lieutenant... Is that an order, Captain? No, Collins. No, it's not an order. They've gone. The truck and Ricker and Bradley and Leggett. The movable cases have gone with them. And it's night now. And the rain has stopped. And you're sitting with the wounded. No sound comes from Murano. No sound in the farmhouse but the low voices of the men. Yes. I mean, it feels like it's bleeding again. Can you have a look? Sure, soldier. Lieutenant. Lieutenant, would you move me just a bit? Yes, I'll be right with you. Yes. Yes, Eddie, just a minute. It's bleeding, isn't it? A little. We'll fix that. Nurse. Nurse. I'm coming, Eddie. I'm coming. You're attending to your wounded. And it's quiet up on Murano. You go to Eddie's cot and put your fingers on his wrist. And while you're feeling the pulse, hearing the steadier, reassuring beat, you hear a motor coming up the road. There's no way of knowing whether it's friend or enemy. The motor gets closer and closer and stops outside in the courtyard. And you hear footsteps coming across the courtyard. And you stand there, counting Eddie's pulse, waiting. Lieutenant Collins? Yes? Message from Captain Ricker. We're getting an ambulance through to you in a few hours. You move your cases as soon as it's light. You take the message and read it through. And it's the first message you've ever received, and it's all very formal, except for the last line. And the last line in Ricker's scrawly writing says, Good luck. And you fold the message carefully because you want to keep it for good. And then you feel like laughing and bawling all at the same time, and you look down at Eddie and smile at him. And when someone says, How's it going up there, Lieutenant? You don't have to lie this time. It's going okay, soldier. We're moving up again. We're going places now. individuals in the armed forces is purely coincidence. Tune in again next week at the same time when the man behind the gun brings you another authentic report of victory in the making. And remember, you'll listen with clearer conscience if you've already bought that extra war bond. The man behind the gun is a Rawson production. Tonight's broadcast was written by Corporal Louis Pelletier, recruiting publicity bureau of the United States Army, and narrated by Jackson Beck. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Van Cleve. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I'm Dennis Daly. Thanks for going along on our journey through the final 25 years of radio. Radio's golden years. Join me again next time.